Welcome to chapter 27. This chapter covers the reproductive system and we'll start with the male. Most of the pieces and parts are already part of your reading assignment, but I do want to go through a quick overview of the path of sperm through this system. Looking at the setup of the male system from the side here, let's start with the testes. And this is where sperm is actually going to be produced. And we'll also find testosterone produced there as well. The sperm, once made in the testes, will then go to the epididymis. And uh, mature further. As they'll pass from there, they'll go into the vas deferens. Sometimes you call this the ductus deferens. It's the same thing. And the job of the ductus deferens is to get out of the scrotum, up through the body cavity here, taking a very looping around route and then it will come up here through the prostate gland and join up with the urethra. At this point here, once we enter the prostate gland, the male and uh, urinary system and reproductive system is sharing common tubing. And that gives us some real advantage from the perspective of not having as much concern about sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, your book now refers to them as sexually transmitted infections, as if an infection is not a big deal, but a disease is. And I'm still going to call it a disease because that's what gonorrhea and syphilis and chlamydia, those are diseases. They're not just a simple infection that's no big deal. So at that point, when we're getting the reproductive system tubing washed out with acidic urine from the prostate on out, that means that those diseases that you may be exposed to are less likely to actually take hold in the body before they're washed out with the next urination event with that acidic urine. So being a male has the advantage of decreased odds of acquiring any particular STD that one might be exposed to. Doesn't mean it's foolproof, but it certainly reduces the chances. So anytime we can stack the odds in our favor, obviously a good thing. At the point where the vas deferens looped around behind the bladder here, so here's the bladder, it looped around behind that and it starts plugging into other things along the way that provide additional components to the semen that we're making. So the semen is going to contain sperm, but only a small percentage of that total volume of semen, roughly a, a maybe a teaspoon or two. So not really a whole lot of fluid going to be produced here overall. Only about 10% of that is going to be sperm, and the rest of it's going to be other stuff. And you'll read about those other stuffs as we go, um, as you go through your reading assignment, but the other things are going to get added in as you go. So the seminal vesicle or seminal gland is going to add some stuff. The prostate gland is going to add some stuff. The bulbo gland is going to add some stuff. So by the time it's all said and done, you get up to around that teaspoon or so of fluid, maybe a little bit more, uh, most of which are stuff that helps the sperm along the way. So it provides a food source for the sperm. It helps to neutralize the acidic environment of both the urethra and the penis and also in the vagina of the female. It helps to stimulate the sperm to swim and a whole number of other things that that is good for. So at that point, once it exits the urethra there at the external urethral orifice, then it's outside the male body and on its own. So that's the general flow of sperm through the body. Let's go a little farther here and look at it from the front side. Looking here, we see the, uh, the testes being stored outside the body in the scrotum. And here's where the textbook makes a statement that's very much false. It talks about the scrotum and says part of the scrotum's job is to protect the testes. And that's complete garbage. Anyone who has testes and a scrotum would know that the scrotum being just this relatively thin layer of skin with a little bit of muscle associated with it provides absolutely no protection for the testes. Um, you think about protection, you think about cushioning, you think about uh, 
protecting from physical harm, and that just is not what happens with the scrotum. Really, the scrotum's job is to adjust the temperature of the testes to keep it a couple of degrees cooler than the rest of the body. We're only talking perhaps a three to four degree temperature difference, but in the world of a sperm, three and four degrees is a really big deal, especially during the sperm making and development stage. So being out there in the testes assists the sperm in staying cooler, and they develop more accurately or more completely that way. So just remember the scrotum is for temperature adjustment, not for protection. If it was supposed to be for protection, uh, it's a horrible design. We can look here at the testes, and on the inside of the testes we find lots and lots of seminiferous tubules, and that's where the sperm is actually made. So you can see the bottom picture here is a slice through a seminiferous tubule, and you can't see it really well, but there are lots and lots of sperm in there. In a later image here, we'll see the individual sperm much more clearly, and you'll come to appreciate exactly how many are in there. But if I were to tell you that the body makes, the, so the testes make on average, 100 million new sperm every day, that's sort of a, a mind-blowing number. That's a little bit difficult to wrap your brain around. 100 million new sperm every day. And I'll go ahead and tell you that the average ejaculate contains about 300 million sperm. So about three phenomenal days of production included in the average ejaculate. And the reason for that is you need lots of sperm so that a, if only a tenth of a percent of them make it up into the fallopian tubes anywhere close to an egg, you still have plenty of them available to fertilize. So at every step along the way, a significant percentage of the sperm that are there die. They're quite fragile little creatures. So if you throw hundreds of millions of them at the egg, the odds are reasonable that enough of them will get there to do the job. And you've heard the idea that it only takes one sperm to fertilize an egg. That's also incorrect. It takes lots and lots of sperm to get the egg in a condition that it could be fertilized. Now, once only one sperm is going to enter the egg, and only one sperm actually fertilizes, but it takes perhaps hundreds or many hundreds of sperm chewing on the outer surface of the egg to get to the point where one sperm can actually enter. So we could really say it takes hundreds of sperm to get to the point where fertilization is possible. So we need a only really a small percentage of that 300 million to get there to have reasonable odds of fertilization. So throw lots of uh, sperm at the problem and odds are something will work. Looking at that a little closer here we see that the seminiferous tubules produce the sperm then they go to the Ricci testis and then to the epididymis. So we've got a little bit more detail here, and once we're in the epididymis, again, we go to the vas deferens, loop up through the body, and out as we've already discussed. One thing to note here is the spermatic cord. The spermatic cord is, think of perhaps the rope on which the testes are dangling, and that rope consists of blood vessels, nerves, ductus deferens, and a little bit of muscle. And that muscle, along with the muscle in the scrotum, will help to adjust the testicles, get them either closer to the body or farther away from the body, depending on whether or not we need to cool off the testes or warm them up. And that's a 24-hour-a-day, 7-day-a-week adjustment process, trying to keep that temperature just right. If we look here... Uh, at this process again. We've got the vas deferens coming in, connecting up with the seminal glands, going through the prostate gland, connecting to bulbo or urethral, and out the penis. If we look at the penis itself, it consists of three primary clumps of tissue. The top two are the corpora cavernosa, and these are the erectile tissues of the penis. Think of them as spongy tissues that fill up with blood when you have the proper hormonal stimulus. So when nitric oxide levels are appropriate, this means really in, in higher quantities, the 
arteries there in the penis through the top of the corpora cavernosa there are going to start releasing blood into that spongy tissue. The veins are going to hopefully constrict a little bit so that the penis begins blowing up like a balloon, only it's blowing up with blood, not air. And as long as blood is flowing into the corpora cavernosa, at least as fast as, if not faster than, it's leaving those tissues, an erection is achieved and maintained. If we look at the bottom section here, the corpus spongiosum, it also has spongy tissue, so that will also fill with blood, but its function is not to provide erection. So it's not going to fill nearly as uh, tightly with blood. And what it's doing basically is blowing up with blood just enough to provide protection for the urethra. So the urethra actually runs down the middle, as you can see here, of the corpus spongiosum. And if we inflate that tissue around it just a little, that helps to prevent the urethra from becoming constricted. So during intercourse, when it's time for ejaculation, if the urethra is being held more in an open, unconstricted or uncompressed fashion, the ejaculate can pass through it much more quickly and easily, and the overall function here really is to launch that semen as fast as you can, as far as you can, and that then allows the sperm a head start. They don't have to swim nearly as far if they are launched farther for free. So holding the urethra in a somewhat open position during erection is designed to allow a higher speed launch of the semen. As soon as the nitric oxide levels drop to the point that this blood in doesn't equal or exceed blood out, then the erection will decline and go away. And that really was all a blood function. Sometimes males, as they age, start to experience difficulty in having appropriate levels of nitric oxide to be able to stimulate an erection. So, in many cases, it's not any anatomical problem, nothing necessarily wrong with the arteries or with the veins, although that certainly is a possibility to explain erectile dysfunction. But the more common explanation is the hormone levels are off. So that is fixable with modern medicine with the idea of Viagra or Cialis. Drugs like that are designed to give a surge of nitric oxide and then stimulate the occurrence of that erection. So this is something that's pretty simple. We'll just take the little pill, and shortly after that, things seem to magically happen. And it's interesting if you've ever paid attention to the wording of the ads. Viagra specifically will say, if you experience an erection lasting longer than four hours, that's a problem, and you should seek medical attention. Think about that for a second. Did anybody think that it was normal for an erection to last longer than four hours? And I'm hoping your answer is no, that's not normal. And it turns out that the penis really is designed to be like a balloon, inflated occasionally, but not inflated for long periods of time, and in this case, not overinflated. So if the penis remains erect too long, what happens is you don't have blood flow. You have blood go in, and it pools in the penis, and then perhaps has a hard time getting out. So the penis becomes like an overinflated balloon. It becomes uh, perhaps overextended. It becomes fragile and can start experiencing necrosis or tissue death because of inadequate blood flow and supply to the living cells there. Now, one would think that an erection lasting anywhere near the four-hour mark would be considered unusual enough by the person experiencing it that they would be willing to seek attention. But that's one of those male psychological things that uh, we really don't want to admit we have anything wrong with us much less something wrong with our reproductive structures. And we would probably rather lose a hand than go into the emergency room and say, I have an erection, it's lasted for a really long time, and I'm worried about that. Now that's quite a silly psychological hang-up to have, but if we're being honest, most males have that. So often if a person goes in with that sort of problem, it's been considerably longer than the recommended four hours and less. 
Part of the concern we would have as well is the treatment method. So the solution for this problem is going to be insertion of two large bore needles, one into each of the corpora cavernosa sections, and to drain out that pooling blood. And obviously that wouldn't sound like a good time either. And it probably is going to have to be done a couple of times over the course of a couple hours until those nitric oxide levels drop off and no longer trigger this event. This would probably happen as well in individuals who didn't need that boost of hormone. So they already had enough, so sometimes folks take Viagra that didn't need it, thinking that it would prolong the experience, and, and it does, but it can also cause those uh, unpleasant side effects of having to go to the hospital and have the penis literally drained of blood multiple times. I'm thinking from the psychological perspective that should be a little bit uh, more than we were looking for. Certainly motivation to never do that again. But if you happen to need that assistance, it certainly often does the trick. Now, if we look here at the path the sperm have taken, it's sort of a looping path. We're making a big circle. We started with the testes, went up the vas deferens, around the top and back side of the bladder, back up underneath the bladder, and back out the penis. So we've made a complete circle and then some. So a question might arise, why did we have such a looping path? Why didn't we just go straight from the testes to the penis and out? Wouldn't that be simpler? And the answer is yes, it would be simpler. And the further answer is that's exactly what we're doing. The testes weren't always in the scrotum. The testes actually started out up here closer to the uh, seminal, seminal vesicles, which are labeled A in this picture. So they were sitting up there on top of and beside the bladder when um, the child was, let's say, developing inside mama. Just the same exact spot that the ovaries would be in a female. That's where the testes were in the male before birth. But because sperm like it cooler to be produced, shortly before, at, or typically shortly after birth, the testes will descend from the abdominal cavity and go down into the scrotum. And in that process, there's not really room for them to go the shortest route. That would be, if we were here, it would just go straight down up underneath the coxal bone here, and straight into the scrotum. There's too much stuff in the way there. So the simpler route is to go forward a little bit. And there's actually a little bit of a canal in the abdominal muscles up front that allow the sperm, or rather allow the testes, to come forward and slide through that canal and then out over the top of this pubic bone here at the front. Then it can go down into the scrotum. So that's just the simplest, less congested way to get out of the abdominal cavity. And because the vas deferens were always connected there, they simply trail along behind. So they were directly straight shot through, connected, but because of the easiest and really only way to get out, so even if we could shove our way down here through past the prostate gland, bulbo urethral gland and such, there aren't any openings down here for the testes to be able to slide through. So we had to go this way, slide through the only opening there was, and come down here into the scrotum. So that's the reason that seems quite convoluted and looping. It was really, physically, the only route out. What we also see in this graphic, and we've seen in most of the others as well, is the presence of the foreskin. So the foreskin is a flap of tissue there at the tip of the penis, at the, the glands penis, or the head of the penis. And uh, that's present at birth for all males. It has become customary in the United States to circumcise male children, typically within that first couple of days to week after birth. And that simply means to surgically cut off that foreskin. The original reasoning for circumcision dates back to Jewish uh, Mosaic law, when Moses commanded all the Jews that they must be circumcised at a certain number of days after birth uh, for males. And uh, that's where the idea came from. And now in the United States, it's just somewhat of a common social practice, not necessarily having any religious connotations anymore. 
At some point along the way, probably in the 50s and 60s, there was an idea that if you remove the foreskin, that makes it less likely that a person will contract a lot of diseases, uh, making you, let's say, less susceptible to acquisition of oh, anything, syphilis, gonorrhea, HIV, you name it. And there was also the idea that if that foreskin is removed, that would reduce the likelihood of penile cancer development. All of those ideas have really pretty much been debunked at this point. So now we might say that it's just a decision that the parents would make that doesn't really have any real biological significance either way. Some folks argue that removal of the foreskin reduces the amount of pleasure that a male is capable of experiencing during intercourse. And to really have a good answer for that, you would have to talk to someone who had their foreskin present experienced intercourse, then had it removed, experienced intercourse, and actually had a before and after comparison. That's probably not something that you're going to find a whole lot of, of folks who have gone through that to be able to know, but about a year and a half ago I had a student whose husband had experienced that, and as part of uh, compliance with her family's religious beliefs, the future husband agreed to become circumcised at that point and he had experienced intercourse before that and then would have been able to experience intercourse after the experience as well and so he then reported that there was a decreased level of stimulation and sensation that occurred without the foreskin present but I think it would be safe to say that it was plenty enjoyable with or without either way so we would say it wouldn't make any significant difference that would change the experience of intercourse. I think it would be safe to say he truly cared about that uh, female to be willing to go through that sort of process just to make her family happy. Let's think about sperm and how the sperm are made a little bit more in depth. I told you already that about a hundred million new sperm are made every day and that was a phenomenal number but I'm going to give you another piece of information that's even more difficult to believe and that is that every single sperm that has ever been made in a, any particular male and every single sperm that will ever be made in any particular male are probably going to be genetically unique so what I'm saying is that a hundred million new sperm per day means a hundred million new genetic combinations every day. So how do we make a hundred million genetically unique new cells every day? And the answer for that is a process called meiosis. In chapter 3 of your Anatomy 1 experience, there would have been the idea of mitosis and that was one cell dividing and becoming two cells going through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase two separate cells produced and both of those cells would have ended up being diploid. Diploid means you have two of every chromosome so a pair of everything. So if humans have 23 chromosomes, individual types, and each one of those exists as a pair, that really means we have 46 individual chromosomes inside each cell, 23 sets. So in mitosis, you start out with those 23 sets. Each of them is copied so that the resulting cells that come from that division each still have 23 sets. So there's a great emphasis placed on keeping the chromosome number the same. And it turns out that human cells really can't survive very much deviation of chromosome number. If the numbers get off, whether it's too many or too few, most of the time that results in immediate death of the cell. So it's really important to keep the chromosome numbers straight. In meiosis, things work in similar fashion but a little bit different outcome. And so we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and that results in two new cells. And just like we saw in mitosis, we doubled the DNA, so we had two sets of chromosomes. So instead of the uh, two sets of 23 pairs, uh, or that's what we had to start with, 
our 23 pairs. We doubled it to have two sets of 23 pairs and then divided so each new cell had 23 pairs each. So that's what we would see down here in daughter cells of meiosis 1. So each of those two cells are diploid. They have 23 pairs. They then go through meiosis again, which is another prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase process. But this time the DNA does not double before it starts. So the 23 pairs that we had in each of these daughter cells here actually become just 23 chromosomes in each of the cells. So this cell divides, becomes two. Each of those have 23 chromosomes, not 23 pairs. Over here, this other cell divided became two. Each of those have 23 chromosomes, not 23 pairs. And so what we've done is we've created a haploid cell. Haploid means you have one of each chromosome, not the normal pair. And so these daughter cells of meiosis II become sperm or become egg. And what we're doing is we're ensuring that the sperm have half the normal amount of DNA. The eggs have half the normal amount of DNA. So that when a sperm and egg gets together, it restores it to the full set of DNA that a living functional cell typically needs to have. If we had sperm that were diploid and eggs that were diploid, we would end up with a tetraploid um, cell, so having four sets of everything, and that would be a real problem. Even if it didn't kill the cell, then we would produce sperm that had four, eggs that have four, the resulting outcome would have eight, and at some point very quickly there's just not physically room inside a cell to put all that DNA, even if it didn't cause other problems. So meiosis is designed to produce cells with half the normal amount of DNA so that when a sperm and an egg get together, you get back to the normal number or no, normal amount of DNA that would be present. So a very important process. But that doesn't necessarily explain how do we get unique cells? How do we get genetically unique cells? And you see here at the bottom that each one of these cells had a little green chromosome and a little purple chromosome. So that gave us some variety here, and we could ne not necessarily always have the same. Some of them will have big purples and little greens. Some would have big greens, little purples. But there's also going to be an event called crossing over occur. And what happens in crossing over is during metaphase, so up here we would have seen metaphase 1, so the first step set of steps we call meiosis 1, the second step or set we call meiosis 2. So up here at metaphase, when we have cells that line up with each other, sorry my mouse pointer keeps disappearing on my side, we have the chromosomes lined up along that metaphase plate. And when they are lined up like that, what happens is that the chromosomes actually stick to each other and when they pull apart in anaphase, what we want to do is we want to pull one purple to one side, one green to one side, a purple to the other side, a green to the other side. But some of those purple and greens actually trade pieces back and forth. So when you pull a green to one side, it might be mostly green but a little bit of purple. You pull the purple to the other side, it might be mostly purple and a little bit of green. So they have traded pieces and parts back and forth, so that by the time we get down here to the bottom to our four daughter cells at the end, we probably have pieces, each one of these little chromosomes, being part purple, part green. Now in real life they're not going to be those colors, but the point is, parts of those chromosome pairs, so it's going to be the same information whether it's eye color or hair color or curly hair or straight hair or whatever it is, it's going to be the same information but it came from a different chromosome pair so instead of calling for blonde hair it might call for brown. And so mixing and matching the chromosomes during this division process means that we get down here to our daughter cells they are completely genetically unique from what the original cell that we started with up in prophase one was. So this is the mixing and matching is what gives us the ability to produce a hundred million genetically unique cells every day. Still a phenomenal process. Still difficult to comprehend. But I'm telling you the mixing and matching here is where we get the variety. 
This is just a little discussion of mitosis and meiosis, so what happens here, what happens there, and overall the idea is the same. In mitosis we started with one diploid, ended with two diploid. In meiosis we go through the entire process twice, starting with one diploid and ending with four haploid. That's the short and simple list of differences. Here's that process, a little bit more detailed. And uh, so all the steps of meiosis 1 up here. And then take each one of those daughter cells and run them through the same process at the end. Again, without doubling the DNA, and we get that. So to answer the question of how do we get so many sperm produced every day, well, if you want 100 million to outcome at the end, but each one can become four, then we don't really have to have that many different cells involved in the process to get that 100 million new ones. We'll talk about eggs and how they go through meiosis a little bit later in the next video, but uh, the general idea is going to be the same for an egg. The difference will be down here at the end of meiosis 2 with the sperm we had four functional sperm. With an egg, only one of those four actually becomes an egg. The other three will donate their cytoplasm, so their liquid nutrient ingredient, and their genetic material will be kind of thrown away. So basically, for every four eggs that are produced, only one of them, hopefully the best one, is selected and actually utilized for the possibility of making a baby. Another thing we'll discover as well is that meiosis 1 occurs typically before a female baby is born. So all the eggs a female will ever produce are produced before she's born. They're made, they'll go through probably meiosis 1, but won't necessarily finish meiosis 2 until perhaps a couple of weeks before they're actually ovulated. So they might sit there sort of in neutral for years until they would then finish meiosis II and be ovulated. And that's also a reason why uh, developmental problems sometimes occur, is because you have an egg that might have been sitting there for 30 or more years in neutral, now is being put in gear again and expected to go forward smoothly. And as you can imagine, something that's been sitting on the shelf for 30 years or more might not go back into gear smoothly might have some problems, and that's where we often run into chromosome number problems and other things, but we'll talk about those in a later video. So here's again the idea of the chromosomes. We don't know what combination they're going to sort in. We might get all purples in one, all greens in another one. We might get combinations back and forth of those. So it's completely random, and we call that independence assortment. That gives us sort of a random lottery draw as to what ends up in any particular cell, guaranteeing that most everyone is different. The idea of 100 million new cells a day. You're perhaps still struggling with that number. So here's a slice through a seminiferous tubule, just like we saw before. And this is a little bit nicer image, actually taking with a scanning electron microscope probably a quarter million dollar microscope. And what you see is great detail. So what we're seeing here in the middle of this image, all these yellow hair-like structures, those are the tails of the sperm that are in development. So just in this one very, very small microscopic slice of tubule, we see hundreds of sperm at that particular spot in development. If I went ahead and told you that if you stretch out all the seminiferous tubules in the testes, they would stretch out to be about a half mile in length. What we're saying is we have a half a mile of tubing that can have hundreds of sperm per microscopic section. So now it starts to make sense that in a half mile of that kind of tubing, we could actually easily fit a hundred million sperm in there at any one time. If we follow the sperm through this process, remember the idea of meiosis was we take a diploid cell, so up here at the top is our cell that has two of each chromosome, put it through mitosis, you can make more of it, but once one of those, so let's say this original stem cell, 
underwent mitosis, made two of itself, one of which stays up there in the tissue so that it can become the next cell available to use, and one of those two would then go into meiosis. So here we have our diploid. It goes through meiosis 1 to or rather, yes, meiosis 1 produces two cells. Each of those produce two, so we get our four. So this is the end of meiosis, and we've got four cells, but they're still round, what we call early spermatids, or uh, undeveloped. So this is what's going on in the early part of the seminiferous tubules. Then they start looking a little bit more like sperm as they develop. So a late spermatid has a head, has a collar, and has a tail, but it's still got a lot of floppy cytoplasm here. A functional spermat spermatozoa, or sperm, has streamlined itself, got rid of that extra baggage, so everything it didn't need it disposed of. It's a hard work to swim, and if you've got these big floppy bags of cytoplasm off to the side, that gets in the way. So streamline, shave off everything you can. So down here at the bottom, we have our four hopefully functional sperm from that process. Now keep in mind when you're making things at the rate of 100 million a day, there are going to be mistakes. So the faster you run an assembly line, the more mistakes get made. So of these four sperm, it's perfectly conceivable that one or even two of them might not be fully functional. They might have some structural deformities that cause them to have a bend in the tail and then not be able to swim straight. Those clearly wouldn't be able to reach an egg and fertilize. Uh, some might have two heads. Some might have two tails. So somewhere in this assembly process, things might have gotten stuck together. Uh, so all sorts of deformities could occur that perhaps up to 60% of that hundred million sperm made every day might be faulty in some way. So really what we're saying is of the hundred million you make a day, only 50 million of those, or perhaps a little bit less, maybe only 40 million of those, might actually be fully functional. So already we've seen this tremendous number of sperm decrease significantly before they've ever been ejaculated. So that's another reason why we have so many, is we can afford to have millions of them be faulty because we have millions and millions of them left over afterwards that are good. It's completely from the male's perspective a numbers game. The more numbers you have, probably the more successful you'll be. If we look at that process occurring actually inside the layers of the seminiferous tubules, up here at the top we have the original cell goes through meiosis, we get our four uh, early spermatids, they develop in the outer layers there, shed their extra stuff, and then once they're released from those uh, supporting tissues, then their sperm that are ready to go to the next step. They're not capable of swimming yet. That will actually happen later at ejaculation. They're exposed to acid and some other chemicals that will then stimulate them to swim. So you could take sperm out of the seminiferous tubules that were completely assembled, throw them into a vagina uterus scenario, and they would just sit there and not do anything because they have to go through those chemical activations to actually make them swim. Looking at this from a different perspective, over here at step one, we have our early spermatid process, starts to grow the flagellum tail, starts to differentiate the head and the collar, starts to get rid of the excess cytoplasm. At the end we have a head, a collar or midpiece, and then the tail. The head is where the DNA is stored. The rest of it is a swimming device. As we can see in this process here, that took about 24 days. So we can say generically, this process might take about a month from the initiation of the first mitosis to start making early spermatids up to the final completion of the sperm. So if we're making 100 million new ones every day, and it takes about a month to get from start to finish, what that really means is that we have billions of sperm in some stage of production within the testes at all times. That's a really big number. But because they are so incredibly tiny, we can fit a lot of them in there. 
All of this is regulated by hormones. And if you've been looking at the text for this chapter yet, you will have perhaps noticed something called the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, or the HPG axis. What that is talking about is the interaction of hormones from where they're produced, where they're stored, and where they eventually carry out a function relative to production of sperm or uh, eggs. So step one up here would be the hypothalamus. It's going to produce things like FSH and LH. So follicular stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. And those are going to be stored in the anterior pituitary. We'll talk about these again when we talk about the endocrine system at the end of the semester. But it's produced in the hypothalamus, stored in the anterior pituitary, then released and actually acts on the gonads, in this case the testes. So when the FSH and LH reaches the testes, that triggers this process of meiosis of sperm formation to occur. So all of this is really coming from the brain, eventually telling the testes what to do. This also triggers the development of testosterone, and that's the second function of the testes, is to actually produce the testosterone, which then has other effects. So increasing testosterone does increase the rate of sperm production. It's also going to stimulate what we see over here at step five, somatic and psychological effects at other body sites. What that means is it stimulates secondary sexual characteristics, like for a male, hair growth on places like the face, where a female typically wouldn't expect to see that happen. It produces the male voice, so a deeper sounding voice. It produces typically larger body size, greater muscle mass, larger, stronger bones. It produces the male psychological and behavioral condition. And if you don't have too much testosterone, that can actually cause some aggressive tendencies. That's a whole nother story altogether. It also determines what kind of external reproductive genitalia develop. So early in development, before the baby is born, it really starts out as a asexual organism. It is not determined to be male or female. Now the genetic decision has already been made, but the actual physical expression doesn't happen until testosterone and estrogen start to be produced. And then the levels of testosterone relative to estrogen will decide, do we produce male characteristics? So if there's more testosterone than estrogen, we'll get a male characteristic like a visible penis, like dissension of the testes, things like that. If there's more estrogen than testosterone, we'll get that same tissue turn into a clitoris instead of a penis, and then express uh, the rest of the body in a more female direction. Development of breasts more so in a female than in a male. So all of those things are results of this, HPG axis and the interactions that occur between them. Normally those interactions are balanced and everything works like it's supposed to. So males express male, females express female. Occasionally those hormone levels get off and the physical expression then becomes perhaps not as clear and definitive as we would like it to be. So at that point, uh, a male might express with some female characteristics, or a female might express some male characteristics. Um, so all kinds of uh, imbalance can occur there, but for the most part, this stays pretty stable. The last thing we want to look at for a male here, and this will wrap up this video, are testosterone levels during life. So at fertilization, there's no testosterone produced because there's no hypothalamus, there's no pituitary, there's no gonads yet. But somewhere in the first month or two, that's going to start happening. So we would see the levels of testosterone in the body take a big jump between, let's say, month one up to about month five, it would peak, and then go back down out to the point of birth. So in that let's say from month one to month nine there's going to be a little bit more testosterone present mostly in the middle of that time frame but at birth the levels have gone down pretty low 
what you will see somewhere between birth and the age of one is another testosterone spike. It's not uh, nearly as significant as the pre-birth spike was, but still a significant spike there. That's going to go ahead and uh, get the testes activated, uh, get them to descend if they haven't already, and start developing uh, things a little bit more clearly in the male direction. Then from the age of 1 out to the age of, let's say, 11 or 12 probably, testosterone levels are going to stay pretty flat and pretty low. Then we hit puberty. Anyone who has a male child who's gone through puberty knows exactly what we're talking about here. Testosterone levels go through the roof. And what's happening here at puberty is the male reproductive system is activating. It's becoming functional. Once this happens, sperm production starts. But testosterone is also driving, remember, the psychological and behavioral functions of a male. So in this time frame, a male child is going to become all kinds of unstable, perhaps emotional. At this point, the voice starts to change. Hair growth patterns might start to change. And uh, perhaps self-discovery starts to happen more significantly there. Lots of things going on because the testosterone levels are skyrocketing. They're heading for adult levels of testosterone. And once that level is reached, let's say puberty started, just for argument's sake, let's say at the age of 12, by the age of uh, 18 or so, that would have reached adult levels of testosterone. At that point, perhaps the behavioral and psychological issues will have leveled out because the levels of hormone have sort of flattened out and the body's becoming accustomed to that. The reproductive system should be fully functional at that point, and we would expect for a significant percentage of the adult life, those testosterone levels would stay at that elevated level, but stable. Out at past the age of 60, you might see testosterone levels start to drop a little bit. That will then, if you notice, the dotted blue line is sperm production levels. So what you see is sperm production follows testosterone. If testosterone is going up, sperm production is going up. If testosterone is going down, sperm production is going down. So after the age of 60, you might see declines in testosterone levels, which would mean you're seeing declines in sperm production levels as well. And down to this 50%. So instead of producing 100 million a day, it might only produce 50 million a day. Still perfectly capable of producing a child because, remember, an ejaculate contains multiple days of production. But it might mean that it's a little bit more difficult because your numbers aren't quite as high. Sometimes males will experience testosterone deficiencies at a point in life where they're not supposed to. So let's say a 40-year-old male would not be expected to have testosterone deficiencies. But sometimes that happens. So you can actually go to the doctor and get testosterone supplementation to get those hormone levels back up to the point where they should be. Because not only would that drop sperm production, it would also cause premature hair loss, cause loss of muscle mass, might cause a hopefully very minor decline of other secondary sexual characteristics like uh, uh, penis development and size, etc. Hopefully those would be minor, but the b problems overall would be something that cumulatively could be a problem. So you just go to the doctor and they can help get those levels back up where they need to be and keep you a little bit more stable that way. Hopefully all this has made sense and been informative and clear. If you have questions, as always, ask those in the discussion board or in our live Zoom sessions. And I'll see you next time talking about female reproduction.